I call this meeting to order. This is the regular meeting of the Northfield Public School Board on Monday, August 22nd, 2011. Dr. Richardson, there were a few items in the table file. Uh, yes, if you will check in your table file, you'll see a uh, set of notes for the uh, state of the district information that I'm going to be presenting tonight, um, which will accompany the materials that you already had that were more detailed information about both celebrations and challenges. We also have a number of personnel items on the consent agenda, including appointments, increase, decrease, and change in assignment, leaves of absence, resignations, and also information on TRA part-time teacher program. So uh, those items need to be uh, considered as part of the agenda. Okay, thank you. If there are no objections, we'll add these to the agenda as we move forward. So we now have an opportunity for public comment. This is a chance for members of the district to address the board. Doesn't look like there's anybody who wishes to address the board. All right. So, okay, we will move on to approval of the minutes. So board members, in your packet, you should have the board minutes from August 8th, 2011. And is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Oh, moved by second. John. I'll take the second. And Jeff will take the second. Do we have any discussion? Okay, all those in favor of approving the minutes for the meeting held on Monday, August 8th, please say aye. 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 Uh, motion carries. Those minutes are approved. Okay, on to announcement and recognition. Dr. Richardson? And this is a very, very quiet meeting because we have no announcements and recognitions, at least none that have been reported to me. I know you, that you do have one that you'd like to share, and uh, but I do not have any for this evening. Do other board members have any to share first? No? Okay, I wanted to... Um, to mention to board members in the community if you haven't heard of AccelerateNorthfield.com yet. And uh, this is a, um, a collaboration between the community members, um, the school district, Carleton College, St. Olaf College, um, the Northfield Healthy Community Initiative. Um, if you were out on the Riverwalk on Saturday, you may have seen information about it. Um, there will be going to be more information at all of the um, open houses at the elementary schools. And what it is, is it's a new way to um, look at closing the achievement gap in Northfield and um, finding volunteers. And there's three ways you can volunteer. One-on-one um, -on -one tutoring, read aloud, and facilitating enrichment challenge groups are the three ways that they're going to initially focus. And it's um, different in, we've done one-on-one -on -one tutoring and read aloud, but it's really fostering a, a mentorship and a relationship with the students. And then the enrichment challenges um, as you know, we made some cuts to the Gates program last year. And so this will really help to um, not just focus on closing the achievement gap for those students who are struggling, but also work on continuing to accelerate our other students. So we're going to be having training sessions um, in September. And I really want to recognize um, Fritz Bogart and Rachel Matney. These are the two Sibley parents that really had the vision for this, and they've pushed it forward on a very short time frame. Um, so they're, it's really piloting it starting this fall, and we're looking for more volunteers. So, Okay. Great. Um, we are now ready for the first item for discussion, which I believe is Dr. Richardson and the State of the District, our celebrations and challenges. And as Dr. Richardson mentioned, um, in addition to what was in your packet, you should also have um, the PowerPoints. All right, uh, this evening we are here to uh, talk about the state of the district. And as we've done now for the last several years, uh, what I want to share tonight is, first of all, looking back, thinking about the things that I think we can be very positive about in this district in terms of the activities that occurred during the 2010-11 year. And then I want to look forward and think about the challenges that we face as we move into 2011-12. And uh, again, I've, I've shared this information for you in a more detailed format in terms of the uh, listings of celebrations and challenges. And then I also have provided you a handout that has the detail from the actual um, PowerPoint presentation. We always begin with the Board of Education, and we think about celebrations in terms of the things that the Board has been involved with. I think the, the key thing is the things that are important for the Board to remember that were completed during this last year 
are again reviewing and revising individual board policies. Again, this was not at the, at the torrid pace that we did over the course of about two or three years when we were completely reviewing all the board policies, but there were a number of individual policies that were brought up to, to date and, and in, in line with statutory changes. We also in-serviced new board members in terms of uh, their roles and responsibilities and gave them opportunities for training outside the district through M SBA. We also determined at this point to maintain our current district strategic plan. I think there's been a sense over the last seven years that the efforts that were involved in that really struck and developed a plan that focused a mission and focused a set of core beliefs that, that people have been very positive about. We'll talk about that again a little bit later. We continue to use the District Educational Program Advisory Council. They have been extremely important in terms of identifying key district issues that are out there and goals and bringing those to you on a yearly basis. I guess it's also important, I think, for the board to realize how positive that group has been through the years. Uh, I've worked in a number of different districts over the last 30 years as a superintendent. This has been the group that I think has been the, the most loyal, the most focused, the most uh, energetic in terms of trying to think about district goals. We typically have anywhere from 25, 20 to 25 people at any single meeting, and they really focus in and take a look at curriculum instruction, student services, and assessment, and uh, three core areas that we think are very important for the district. We also uh, completed a very rigorous and extensive application process. And although there was there not a lot of sweat equity on the board side, you were the ones that had to, to approve that. Again, uh, for your knowledge, we probably now are among about, I think, five school districts in the state that are currently part of the authorizer group. The other authorizers tend to be non-schools, non-school districts. They tend to be either what they call single purpose uh, authorizers, or they tend to be um, colleges or universities. Many other school districts have dropped out of that authorizer role because the process to become an authorizer was too intensive. And as you remember, we talked about all the things that had to go had to be done, basically a almost 300 page document, then a, a revision of that document to reflect um, a basically a three hour uh, presentation to the Department of Education followed up by additional questions that we had to answer before we were finally given authority. Uh, also, it probably would be good for the board to know that uh, the information that we developed, uh, I ended up sharing with two other districts. So of the five districts that are authorizers now, actually three of them are using documentation and strategies and approaches that we designed. Uh, so we feel pretty good about that. Uh, also, uh, with that new authorizer approval, we were in place then to do the five-year reauthorization of Prairie Creek, and that would be the first one that's gone under the, the more detailed reauthorization process. We also, I think, and, and I think it's important for the board to know, because not every school district does this, but if you think about your own activities each month, where you basically take the time to celebrate the accomplishments of students and staff, and basically support our school improvement process and PLC accountability, that's a very positive piece. It shares that information out with the community. It makes sure that they know the good things that are going on in the system. And it also shares the accountability uh, we have for the work that's being done. In terms of curriculum instruction, second area, basically the, the pieces that we really were able to see continue to flourish this year uh, in 2009-10 included really the, the growth and really uh, demonstrated viability of the ninth grade academy and the, the, the impact that that's having on the reduction in the number of kids failing classes in ninth grade. On top of that then is the 10th grade follow-up which was implemented for the first time this year which took a number of the students that were in the ninth grade academy and gave them a second year to carry forward again to help them uh, be supported and uh, continue that successful implementation. And again, if you remember from the data that we got from the ninth grade academy, we saw a drop of, I believe, somewhere around 25% down to about 8 or 9% in terms of the number of freshmen failing 
one or more classes. So it's a remarkable effort in terms of changing that uh, dynamic. We also see, have seen some real growth and continued growth in responsive classroom as a strategy to support positive interaction for kids and positive discipline at the elementary level. We're seeing a, a, a further growth with that in terms of the number of students that are, or number of staff members being trained and the number of classrooms using responsive classroom on a regular basis. We're seeing that same thing happening with cognitive coaching last year where we had uh, two of our teachers at the high school who were trained in cognitive coaching actually were able to implement that with a number of teachers, including all of the probationary staff at the high school, as well as a number of tenured staff who requested additional support through coaching. Uh, this model has been around for a number of years, and it's one that really helps people to plan and deal with issues and, and develop strategies to address and solve problems. Also, a core uh, piece that occurred during this last year and a piece that's really had a huge impact on our district has been the modification of the elementary specialist schedules. And by moving to a schedule where basically elementary specialists were assigned to a particular building, given in some cases a little more FTE to work with, but giving principals complete flexibility in terms of assigning that FTE through the day, we have completely changed, I think, the dynamic in, in our all three of our elementary buildings. It's given us the ability to have common planning time for elementary teachers, common instructional time where they're all teaching reading or math or, or other course work at the same time. It's giving us the ability to pilot and practice flexible grouping where we actually move students around uh, to really support their abilities and their needs at a particular time. It's helped us to really begin to implement intervention strategies when students are struggling and not being successful. And it's made a huge difference in collaboration, especially tied with PLCs. And then finally, in terms of celebrations, uh, we've also been able to continue to move forward with Bridges Decay, 6th grade web, ninth grade link crew. Again, uh, if, if we look at this across other districts, I think we have the most uh, complete type of program available that supports kids as they come into every single level of our instructional program to be comfortable in their new environment, to be able to be successful as they move in. A couple of other things in terms of curriculum instruction. Obviously, after the uh, decision on the board the, at the end of the previous year, we actually implemented the modified Compañeros program and ESL programs. We have new first grade uh, Spanish literacy that was implemented this year with new text materials and so on. Uh, again, is really changing the focus of Compañeros to strengthen the, uh, the rigor of that program and support our kids. Uh, we've also in, uh, looked and continue to work with class size and program choice because what we do know is beyond that first grade level where we were able to get the class sizes balanced and so on, we still have issues in terms of class size and balance in second, third, fourth, and fifth grade, which we need to continue to address and have used our, uh, for this previous year, 2010-11, uh, have been able to use the contingency funding to help support. We also have continued to work the curriculum review cycle. Uh, and again, uh, you can go to a lot of other districts in the state that don't have a sophisticated cycle that really takes a look at every single curriculum area every seven years and basically refocuses, brings us up in terms of standards, identifies new curriculum materials that are needed, and identifies technology and so on. And I need to uh, tip our hat to DCSDC who have led the majority of the curriculum training for staff and also training on PLCs and have really stepped forward uh, to provide teacher-led training of teachers in terms of, of how to do a better job with curriculum. And finally, we've continued to work with online programming at the high school. That's not growing, I guess, as fast as maybe we hoped it would grow, but we're still seeing really good results from the classes that we're offering and have maintained the opportunities for us to continue to do that through a cooperative effort with Southeast Service Co-op. We look at assessment accountability in terms of this last year. I think the, some of the really positive things that we've seen, the continued implementation of our weekly professional learning communities. 
uh, the curriculum-based measures and universal screening for differentiated instruction. Again, coming out of professional learning communities with the idea of saying that we really need to measure uh, the, the performance of students in various curriculum areas and really use universal screening so that we can determine at the beginning of the year where are kids in terms of their performance and then actually differentiated instruction to reflect the fact that we're seeing kids in different uh, positions as they come into a particular grade level. We also are doing the ongoing information on PLC impact. As a board, you heard every month the presentation. We have materials out on our website. We have materials that were, were shared. Uh, we have a number of video resources for people to take a look at. Uh, we also have continued to work with our site improvement and staff development plans and again working to, to get a, a, a model that really works well that ties that piece together with PLCs and then with the district and Greenville Park AYP improvement planning process. Um, above and beyond what we ever thought we'd originally have to do, but basically all of those pieces now tend to gel pretty well. And in, in fact, what we're finding with the AYP process is a strong push by the state to have professional learning communities and what they call embedded staff development, which means embedded in the workday. So we're really almost a step ahead because we've, we've been able to get that piece implemented. Also, we've continued to work with the NCA National Accreditation Review, and Joel has worked with uh, his staff to work on, on the data that was received there. And we have worked on how do we continue to ramp up the district assessment coordination. And I guess you need to think about the fact of we go back not more than 10 years ago, we were testing kids in third grade and fifth grade and eighth grade, period. Now we teach, test kids in third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, tenth, and eleventh. And the, the number of, of tests and assessments that we provide is significantly greater. Plus, we've also implemented the plan test the explore test and really looking at the ACT because we have almost 80% of our kids taking the ACT as a really a good measure as we move into high school of how are our students doing in terms of being prepared for uh, not only high school graduation but for college success. Computers for assessment also is a big part of that and we'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of the technology. <laughs> But what we're going to be seeing as we move into this spring will be even greater reliance in terms of uh, the testing on computerized testing and a number of different times that we have to use it. So we've continued to try to build our capabilities to use the computer technology because MCA tests are all moving towards a computerized version. In terms of student services, uh, I think what, what's important for the board and, and community to understand is that we've continued to need to address increased numbers of early childhood uh, students. Uh, those numbers have gone up dramatically this last year, uh, which has uh, forced us to look at how do we provide additional sections of early childhood programming for, for students. And also the other population that's growing dramatically are, is our what we call our 18 to 21 year old transition population. Students who graduate from high school but typically need uh, additional years of support prior to going into some kind of a vocational rehabilitation program, sheltered workshop, group home, etc. Uh, we've also done some work in terms of exploring countywide programming to help make this happen, and we'll talk a little bit more about that when we look at challenges going forward. We also have been very involved in terms of formal monitoring and compliance. Um, and this has changed dramatically in this last year. Up until that time, basically monitoring and compliance typically was the, the state coming out and maybe identifying five or ten things that you needed to do differently. Now the routine monitoring and, and compliance comes out with literally hundreds of requirements for small adjustments and changes in your programming. Fortunately, again, we've, we've had the skill set of Dr. Gary Lewis and other members of the special education team 
they have really led the way in terms of, of the compliance process. I know that we've reported back that the number of areas where we've had to modify uh, our IEPs and other documents has been significantly lower than other districts, but this is a huge new set of efforts in terms of putting this together. We've, we've continued to, to finish up and work on the Student Services Handbook. Again, bringing that up to speed, we'll be talking a little bit about that later in terms of some new additions for this coming year. Uh, we've also modified our cooperative programming, and just recently you guys approved the co-location agreement with the county and also the new agreement with Faribault, uh, again, providing us not only programming for day treatment uh, and, and level four programming in terms of the, the mental health issues, but also pro providing uh, support for level four EBD programming at Faribault. Uh, and we're taking advantage of both of those significant reductions in cost in terms of comparable costs if we would send students to programs in the Twin Cities. Special education staff are continuing to get training, CPI, CPR training, which again is extremely important. Uh, CPR training with the fact that we, are, uh, that we are continuing to grow the number of very fragile, medically fragile students in terms of their support. CPI basically training to help us make sure that when students need to be restrained uh, to protect themselves or protect other students that we have students that have the training to do that effectively. We've also done some significant reconfiguring of our Title I services, again trying to deal with the issue that at least in last, this last year that just finished up, we actually saw a reduction in the Title I funding. And finally, we've really worked on increased ESL services in terms of being able to um, support the needs of our ESL students. And by doing that, we've actually increased the amount of direct service by reducing the amount of services uh, that are we're going before to a district level coordinator type position. We also have worked with ESL staff in the PSYOP training piece. That continues to be a very, very positive training strategy for supporting not only our ESL teachers but also regular ed teachers in terms of their special education support and their ESL support. Uh, we also began additional READ 180 programming at Bridgewater. Again, the boards heard about the impact of READ 180 at middle school and high school in Greenville Park. Uh, again, we've seen some excellent results from this. The data that we got at the early, in early summer showed just some unbelievable results with some kids growing as much as three or four years in terms of their reading skills in the course of a year. Uh, we also have, have continued to work with our ALC programming. Again, a number of you went to the ALC graduation this spring. I think we graduated, if my memory serves me correctly, I think 39 students that graduated this last spring. Again, probably an all-time high. Uh, this program has really changed dramatically, and, and Noel and others that have been around on the board for a while remember at the times when we really weren't seeing that many graduates and we we're seeing a lot of kids struggling and not really getting very far with it. This program has really changed uh, in terms of its focus on seat time and graduation. And also because of the fact that we really run a full-blown ALC, it's given us huge amounts of additional support to do targeted services. And those targeted services dollars basically provide some support for both elementary and middle school, which are tied very directly to uh, the work that's done with community services to provide the enrichment side of that remediation. And finally, uh, we've continued to update our crisis intervention plan. Every time we think we've identified every possible crisis option that's available, somebody comes up with three more, and so we make sure that those pieces are included. As far as community services, I think one of the hallmarks of, of the work that, that was done over the course of the last year is the real uh, hard, difficult work in terms of putting together the district-wide communications plan. Again, if you remember, we worked very closely with Nuger Communications uh, to basically build a plan that allowed us to do uh, new websites at both the district and building levels, to look at uh, new logos, to look at all the other pieces that help us to get the message out to our community about the value of a Northfield education. And again, doing this at a very, very reasonable cost 
um, in comparison to what it would have cost us if we'd not had a really good partner and collaborator in, in Nuger. We also had grant funding uh, in community services. Uh, as I, I know Hannah has mentioned to you guys on multiple occasions, we are continually, through community services, scrambling to find the dollars to provide all of the programming we want to provide. And um, I think the, uh, the entrepreneurship of the community services area has been vital in terms of trying to find what are the dollars we need for PLUS, what are the dollars we need for school readiness support, and making sure that those dollars are available so we can support programs. And knowing that without those dollars, those programs basically go away. We've also seen increased community awareness, enrollment, and participation in community services activities. And again, focusing on making sure that, that the dollars work. Uh, and as you know, we've gone through several reiterations of the community service budget to try to reflect our kind of the new reality of, of the kinds of programming that, that parents and community members want to, to spend dollars on. Always with a focus on making sure that the revenues, whether they're fee-based or grant-supported, match up with the expenditures and reducing expenditures when they don't. In terms of human resources and staff development, during this last year, we completed negotiations with 15 non-teacher groups. And again, uh, the, the collaboration level, the willingness of those groups to really sit down and think about where did we need to be as we were moving into a year when we knew we were going to need to address budget issues, I think is extremely commendable. Uh, again, all 15 of those groups basically looked at no increases in um, their base salaries, no increases in steps, very similar to what the teachers had agreed to in the two-year agreement that was was negotiated prior to that. Um, again, that really made a difference in our ability to, to put our bottom line in order, uh, and I think is a real tribute to those folks of, of really looking out beyond just the immediate uh, individual needs that they had. Also, I think a major coup for HR was the implementation of the self-funded health insurance program. Uh, and again, moving forward for this coming year now with that particular piece in place, and again, the work between the uh, business office and the HR department to really put that piece together. Good collaboration again with our various bargaining units so that they were willing to move forward with this. And as a result, moving forward into this coming year with no increase in uh, health insurance for 2011-12. Again, because of that work and also then building an initial balance to make sure that as we need dollars to get us started, that we aren't starting from ground zero in terms of dollars available. Obviously, we also hired a new Director of Business Affairs, and we're very, very pleased with that hire. Uh, but obviously, that was a, a piece that we weren't really anticipating at the beginning of 2010-11 to need to do. But uh, I think it was carried out very, very professionally. We also, again, with Human Resources, have, have done a great deal of training and support for professional learning communities in cooperation with, with the curriculum and instruction uh, staff. Uh, and we've also worked to provide cultural competency <coughs> training, which was a, a, a rollout or an extension of what we'd done with the family project in the previous year uh, to really support every building in terms of having a new understanding of cultural competency and how that impacts and how that works with um, those needs uh, in terms of, of how uh, well parents and students are going to interact with schools. We also uh, had, I think, had some excellent training in terms of student management strategies with Corwin Cronenberg, uh, one that, that we actually presented not only to teaching staff but also to all the other staff in the district, got very, very positive reviews just for just down-to-earth common sense strategies for how to interact and work with kids. And then finally, in terms of human resources and staff development, uh, we continue to work always on recruiting and retention of quality staff. We've reported to you a little bit already about the, the, I think, the quality of staff that we've been able to recruit at the end of this last year in preparation for this year. Uh, again, I think we, we've been able to do that because we had the funding available. We weren't looking at the level of cuts that many other districts were looking at, and we were able to take advantage of that along with a quality process. And then finally, the, the thing that you always have to keep working with is 
job description, job ranking, evaluation instruments, and so on. We also did, uh, working with the evaluation process, uh, Matt Hillman spent a significant amount of time with the uh, cabinet working through uh, teacher evaluation, looking at that piece, which is fortuitous because now we're moving into two years of preparing to, to implement new teacher evaluation programming that was part of the special session uh, approval of the education budget. In terms of technology, uh, we continue to, to upgrade the quality of technology we have available for our classrooms. 27 additional digital projectors, 29 additional smart boards. boards. We basically now have completed the rewiring of all of the buildings, so all of our buildings now are up to CAT 6, Category 6 wiring, which again gives us the ability to um, basically uh, get data around the buildings very quickly, and that linked with the fiber optic backbone across all of the buildings in the district puts us, I think, uniquely positioned to address technology needs going forward. Also, and, and again, I, I think uh, through the work of Matt and others, we've really seen some enhancement of our training opportunities. Uh, we, have a, we had a summer tech boot camp last year, another summer tech boot camp this year, um, where basically for an entire week we had staff members coming in on their own, uh, getting uh, training on specific things that they were interested in, and again, some really quality support with uh, not only our own staff coming in and providing uh, the role as trainers, but then also individuals from uh, both the Southeast Service Co-op coming in to work with us, and also uh, Speech Gear, which is a, a program that we use for Spanish translation, and then they also did come in and do training for us. Uh, we also, I think, uh, can celebrate, and many of you have taken a look at the new district website uh, and, and the work that was done in that, which again ties back to that communication plan. Uh, really working with that piece along with productivity software and district network platforming uh, to really uh, provide a higher quality environment for us and the availability of that technology for all of our staff and students. We look at our facilities in terms of celebrations. Uh, obviously the major celebration is we got it done on time, it opened up, everything is good, the Sibley edition is in good in. Uh, in good stead moving forward for this uh, last year. We also got the renovations done in the building and I know some of you as we walked through in August were, last year were going, is this going to get done as we were still looking at the bathrooms with you know, a foot of dust in them and, and no floors yet. Uh, but all of, the, all of those renovations got done to really upgrade grade the quality of restroom facilities in the other part of the building, modifications of the office area for safety and security and also a brand new playground area and brand new uh, blacktop surface area. So again, a, a very positive piece, again, done on time and on budget. Uh, we also had the district receive Energy Star recognition, and a number of you were at the plaque ceremony in terms of the plaque that was put up here in the high school. Again, uh, with a, over 10% a reduction in energy usage, uh, which qualified us for that Energy Star recognition. Again, very, very positive piece, I think, that talks about stewardship of the community's uh, funding that they provide to us to support our schools. We also went through a secondary facilities review as we talked about the YMCA and really tried to get a, a good, hard look at what we needed at the secondary level in terms of making uh, and the needs of that particular building. We also did building security and we began the first part of that process with implementation of security cameras at both high school and Sibley, uh, and began really the first part of a long-term effort that will take several more years. We also continued with a 10-year capital plan. And again, we focus on maintaining that long-term plan because in that format, we're always thinking about not just the thing that's broken today, but also the things that if we don't take care of them, will break over the next several years. And uh, again, I think think like uh, a good homeowner, we're trying to, to not only deal with things that break, but we're also trying to deal with things that will do the appropriate preventive maintenance. As far as celebrations for budgets and funding, I guess I'm not sure if celebration and budgets and funding all go in the same <laughs> word, but we're going to call it that anyway. Uh, several things that happened. 
we went through a compliance review on federal stimulus rules, uh, got a clean bill of health, and, and again, uh, gave both Stephanie and Val uh, a chance to show their mettle in terms of surviving that audit. Uh, and again, that went extremely well, and, and uh, the state was very happy with the work that we'd done there. We were able to maintain the budget reductions. We were able to maintain our enhanced uh, fund balance. And so during this last year, we did not cut staff or programs during the 2010-11 uh, school year. We also dealt with, and I think admirably, with a, a, a state freeze, state funding shifts when we went from um, 90-10 to 73-27 to 70-30. We also dealt with short-term borrowing, the second year of short-term borrowing during 2010-11. And we also dealt with a number of underfunded mandates. And we did that all and, and still were able to maintain all of our programming in place. And then we went through the difficult process this last spring of doing additional budget reduction. And in that situation, we involved 180 staff and community members to basically stabilize our budget, not only to deal with, with what we needed to do for 2011-12, but because of the final outcome at the state level, also to carry us forward into 12-13 without having to make additional cuts. We also brought forward and began to talk about a plan to revoke and increase our current operating levy and also to renew our current capital projects levy. Uh, and again, really trying to think out long term in terms of what will the needs of the district be as we move forward over the next 10 years and how do we provide the greatest stability we can possibly have. And we also address class size issues, again, using the uh, contingency fund funding, but also dealing with the impact of NCLB sanctions which basically take between 20 and 30 percent of our Title I money away and mm -hmm. set it aside to do uh, transfer of students from one building to another and to provide uh, programming for uh, SES or individual tutoring activities. And then finally we dealt with Title I set-asides and were able to get that addressed. Now let's talk about challenges. So if we think about those are all the, and again, I, as I said, some of these you can quantify as un, you know, undeniably just really positive things. Uh, others that are positive only because we survived them or did as, as well as we could with them. Let's take a look at the challenges for this coming two-year period. As a board, uh, guess what? Part of your job always is policy revision. So. What you, you will see as we go into this next year will be the additional need likely to look at, at policy revisions going forward. Uh, we will try to bring those to you as we need to. We also will need to decide at what point we need to ask the board to begin going through and doing another review of all the policies. I think uh, th there was a level of, of strain and stress. This may not be the year to really get into that but it's just important that we're prepared to address those policies that need to be addressed. We also need to think about the district strategic plan review. And I think as a board, we have a number of new board members now in place. And it may be a time when the board needs to think seriously about at least going back and looking at the strategic plan that's in place, deciding if it still matches us in terms of what we believe is our mission and our beliefs and our strategies or do there need to be changes? And that's not a simple process. That's basically one that's going to require a lot of, of effort and then some very concentrated effort for about two days and a commitment on the part of board members and the commitment on the part of a number of community members to be involved in that strategic planning process. It's also going to be important, I think, for the board to continue to take a look at our DPAC goals think about how those pieces fit and you, uh, I think as you've noticed the DPAC goals are more and more focusing on uh, how do we really address student success? How do we address the issues of uh, the achievement gap? How do we address the issues of uh, trying to make sure that we support our students and, and make them feel as positive as they can about being here at school? So again that becomes an ongoing issue. And then we're ready now for the expanded evaluation of Art Tech. They're now coming back for their five-year reauthorization. And so we'll be doing that 
uh, during this year. And also, we will be doing an, an enhanced yearly evaluation of both Art Tech and Prairie Creek, which means uh, superintendent and other members of cabinet will be responsible for making visitations to Prairie Creek and to Art Tech to prepare them for not only the reauthorization, but also for the annual pieces. We take a look at curriculum instruction. Uh, we want to continue to focus on that ninth grade academy. Uh, Joel is indicating to us that they're going to be making some additional uh, revisions to the 10th grade continuation program. It's, it, they have some things that they really believe they need to continue to adjust to really make that do what it needs to do. Ninth grade academy is strong. There are issues with the 10th grade continuation that they, they think they need to, to work on, and I think they think they can get the bugs out of it in the second year. We also will see some significant increase in cognitive coaching. Uh, what has happened over the last spring and into this summer has been that every member of cabinet has gone through an intensive, uh, basically six-day training session uh, in terms of cognitive coaching. We'll also be looking at other possible cognitive coaches to be trained and then thinking about how do we implement that across the district and with our partners at St. Olaf and Carleton because uh, they have been a, a, a very, very positive collaborative partner in terms of helping to uh, provide and support the training and also, we believe, giving us some abilities to have coaches be able to sit down and interact and talk about how it's going for them. Uh, and we will also, again, make a lot of use of our teaching staff that have already been trained there and have been in the coaching process for over a year now. Uh, we also are going to continue to ramp up the elementary specialist, uh, the use of the elementary specialist scheduling uh, for the common planning instruction and looking at really how do we support flexible learning to the greatest possible extent and interventions to the greatest possible extent. We piloted a number of pieces this last year. I think what, what you're going to be seeing now is buildings really thinking about how do we do that uh, on a very deliberate basis throughout the curriculum. And I think that will tie very closely to the next piece, which is the cluster group training. Uh, every, almost every one of our third through fifth grade teachers uh, went through cluster group training, uh, actually today, and along with the three elementary principals. And that was presented by, uh, by Diane Heacock, who is a, a nationally renowned uh, teacher who teaches uh, information on cluster uh, education and also on differentiated instruction. And we'll be using that along with then work that that group will do to prepare teachers to think about the operation of the, of the clusters. And we have already done the, the work to basically cluster students at each grade level in third through fifth grade, again with the idea that we are reducing the variation in the ability group across in each cluster. Uh, and also doing that both for compañeros and contemporaries. So we've actually been able to expand it from what we originally thought, uh, which I think is going to make it more effective and also uh, more positive for our parents and kids. Again, we, I think we need to continue with Bridges to K, Web, and Link. Uh, Bridges to K continues to be an ongoing issue because that's one where community services really has to work to make sure that we can get the funding we need to make that happen. But in terms of opening the doors for students, especially students who have had little preschool experience or who have not had experience in terms of uh, formal education opportunities, it really makes a difference in terms of how they're able to start their schooling. And so we want to continue to try to make that piece work. And I know that Community Services works hard to identify dollars each year for that. We also will be continuing to modify Compañeros. That's going to be on your radar screen now for the next three or four years because we're just moving through the grades. Remember this year now we moved to second grade with uh, second grade getting a, a new Spanish literacy curriculum to work with their, their English literacy curriculum for Compañeros. And again, that will occur a year at a time until we move through all five grades with the new literacy program in the process. We also will continue to work with class size and program choice because remember that grades three through five still in some cases have multiple sections 
of Compañeros or contemporary, and because of that, there are still some significant differentials in terms of class sizes. Again, we'll be continuing to work on the next curriculum cycle and also working on our continued online learning. In terms of assessment accountability, uh, the ramp up with professional learning communities this year is really going to be how it ties into AYP uh, and the focus on analyzing data, identifying students, and implementing instructional strategies uh, because those are going to be the drivers that AYP will require, but also the drivers that make sense for PLCs. If we, if we aren't getting teachers who are really sitting down each time to say, how are the kids that I'm working with doing? What uh, students maybe are not doing as well as I'd like them to do? What students maybe need more enrichment opportunities? And then really thinking about what strategies you do differently. We're really not getting the full benefit of the PLC process. We will continue to do information for the board uh, on a regular basis throughout the year in terms of PLCs in the classroom and be able to share that with the community. We'll also continue with, with our staff development continuous uh, site improvement model because it, it dovetails very tightly with AYP. Uh, we also will be dealing with AYP uh, district and building responses. The big concern we have this year is if we have no data. It's very likely we'll, we'll not have any data until the 30th of September. What does that mean? Well, what it means is we don't know what the status of Greenville Park is at this point. We don't know what the status of Bridgewater is at this point. We know Greenville Park will remain in, in needs improvement. We don't know if Bridgewater is going to be in needs improvement. But again, what we know is, in, in at, at least in the case of Bridgewater, the area where they are not making adequate yearly progress is, uh, I believe, is special education reading. And again, as we've talked about a number of times before, when you think about the ability of all students in a subgroup to be proficient at grade level, when the definition of a, of a student who qualifies for special education, in most cases being two or more years below grade level in terms of performance, it doesn't take a great leap to think that we are going to hit a brick wall pretty quickly where we're not going to be able to continue to ratchet up their performance uh, to a grade level performance. So uh, what we don't know obviously is that impact and, and that's going to make some significant differences. And it's also forcing us to do some things that are a little different like sending letters to Greenville Park parents saying, yes, you have the ability right now to transfer and get transportation, but oh, by the way, you may not get it because as soon as we know what the transportation and transfer policy is, if, if, Greenville, if Bridgewater is now in needs improvement, then there are no transfers that are allowed or paid for in terms of the transportation side. So um, it makes for a very difficult situation. And as Danita and I talked about this afternoon, probably some parents that will be upset, at least on the short term. So just be aware that that may happen as people are trying to struggle with, well, why don't you know whether I can tr transfer and get transportation from Greenville Park to Bridgewater? We just don't know right now, and we won't likely until close to the end of the month of September. We also are going to be working and really expanding the concept of universal screening and process monitoring, which is really the piece that drives our ability to do flexible grouping and uh, addressing students' uh, support and instruction at their ability levels. Uh, we've, we've kind of tried out a number of different things you may have heard different buildings talking about using Ames Web or using uh, Dibbles or using uh, wireless generation or using other components to basically do that screening. We're really working with, with how to get some consistency across buildings in terms of that piece so that we can really take a look at and get kids identified in groups earlier. And then the progress monitoring, meaning that uh, on a very regular basis, we're checking in to see how our kids doing. We're trying to figure out, are they still achieving well? Do we need to come back and look at other options? And we need to think about what are called tier two and three services, which are the services that you provide for students who are not being able to be successful uh, in the regular classroom and need additional support and help. 
We also, uh, Joel is going to be working more directly this year in terms of the response plan for the Nas for national accreditation through NCA. We're also going to see, and as I've said before, increased test demands and coordination. We now have a new set of reading tests that will be implemented this next year, which will be online. Uh, we're just going to see math tests now where the MCA math test will, can be given up to three times a year instead of just once. But with the idea that if a student passes the MCA math test, not passes, but uh, is proficient on the MCA test the first time around, they don't have to take it the next two times, but it gives us the ability to, to build proficiency and not uh, continue to um, have students who already are performing at proficient levels continue to have to retake. So that's a, a big change, but it also has a huge impact not only on the assessment folks, but also on the technology folks, because now remember that any of those assessments that are done in the lab, that is, the impact of that is it shuts the lab down for the blocks of time when that's available. We also have increased uh, technology, as I mentioned. In terms of student services, that the continuation of the early child and an 18, 20, one year old program continues to be a piece. What we're really going to need to focus on this year is can we come up with a, a process that allows us to work directly with Faribault to provide a 18 to 21 year old program uh, jointly between the two of us? Because we still think that's a much better option than having students have to travel to somewhere in the Twin Cities to get a transition program. So we're going to be working to try to make that happen. Uh, we also are g going to need to be uh, dealing with all of the corrective actions that are required from the special education monitoring and compliance. Each one of those requiring a written narrative response. Um, and again, although we are significantly reduced in terms of the level from other districts, we still have a number of, of responses that we have, although I know Gary is continuing to question some of them and actually get some of them removed from the list. Uh, we also are going to be needing to deal with district-wide restrictive procedures. And you're going to hear a lot more of that as we move forward into the year. Well, that's a new law that was passed at the state level, patterned off some uh, activity at the federal level. What it basically says is any time that a teacher touches a student and that student resists that touch. In other words, let's think about this. Um, a student gets out of line in, in a line going down, down the corridor. The teacher places hands on the shoulder and moves the student back into line. The student goes into line fine. The student pushes back and tries to stay out of line. Then we have a situation now where we have to report that and there has to be an investigation. It, we are looking at this at all levels, trying to think about how this is going to play out, especially thinking about this at the preschool level, where we have, have rooms that have toddlers in them, where uh, you who have been parents know what happens when your two-year-old says no, and you have to deal with, no, you need to go over and sit in that chair for a few minutes because of the way you're behaving. So we don't know to what extent you know, this is going to impact all of those pieces. But right now, it appears like one of those things that's the knee-jerk reaction from a singular situation where probably someone did behave very inappropriately in terms of restriction. But it's going to impact a whole bunch of other folks who are using restriction for very appropriate reasons with kids. We also will continue to work on Student Services Handbook and, again, adding a whole set of procedures and policies on restrictive procedures. Uh, we also will be looking at level four special education programs now being implemented at, in Faribault for both uh, the uh, day treatment program in terms of mental health services and also in terms of the programming uh, for level four EBD. We'll continue to do our training in CPI and CPR. We'll continue to work as hard as we can to maintain all the ESL staff that we have in place and give those staff the kind of support they need. Uh, we will continue to work with our ALC programming. That's an ongoing piece trying to maintain numbers there, but again, the quality is up. And we also need to always be aware of what kind of crisis intervention adjustments need to be made. In terms of community services, the key challenges this year is the actual implementation of 
the unified district wide communications plan we've got a number of those pieces in place the focus really is on what is the value of a northfield education and and the quality of that educational program and why it's important for people to know that we also are working with community services they've stepped up as we've thought about a y p and said we could provide an ses program right here in northfield up till now there were no programs that qualified to provide individual student tutoring in Northfield. The closest program was in Burnsville. And so uh, they went to get together, put together their proposal and application and have now been approved. And we're actually now sending out uh, letters to other districts, surrounding districts who don't have these programs to say we have options for you for your SES. So our hope there is to provide a program to meet our own students' needs, plus possibly provide and generate a, some additional dollars for um, community services. We also be will be looking at the expanding and marketing of community education programs and enhanced customer support. Uh, this really especially is, is in a new set of scheduling software and a new set of registration software, again, that I, we hope will make the interface for, for customers and for individuals who are wanting to sign up for courses and classes and other activities and ability to do that. Ongoing issue of, of looking for grants for the PLUS program, for school readiness program, et cetera. And then finally, uh, as you know, a focus always with community services of you, you, only ha you can only provide what you have the revenue to provide. And so there's that, that constant balancing process of revenue and uh, expenditures. In terms of human resources, guess what? We're back to the teacher contract this year, 2011-13 teacher contract negotiations. We'll be talking about that a little later in closed session in terms of where we are after six or seven sessions with teachers. Um, again, that's always a, um, a long process and a, and a process where we really have to work to help them understand what our needs are and, and work with them in terms of, of collaborating on that process. Um, we're not yet near the conclusion of that negotiation. We also actually have to implement all the self-funded insurance programming options. Uh, that actually takes an impact or takes effect the 1st of September of this year. Uh, also working with continued work on training and support for weekly PLCs, recruiting and training staff, and also the ongoing updating of job descriptions ranking and beginning this year to work on now that we've talked about the evaluation strategies let's take a look at what the state is looking at needing to propose and thinking about what could be the Northfield version of that process in terms of technology we continue to work to, to bring our technology into line uh, we had a long way to go to, to basically build that and we've been actually building the, the strategies are on model classrooms, et cetera, over at least the last seven or eight years. Uh, the next piece, now that we have all of the wired portion of our, of our programming in place, is really to enhance the wireless network it's with the idea that then students can take laptop computers, portable devices, other pieces, go anywhere in the building and use those and be able to connect into the network. We know that that really tends to be the tipping point in terms of when technology really becomes the resource we want it to become. Uh, we also will continue with technology training and support. Uh, we will also see the implementation of all the new building websites this year. So we'll have new building websites that are going to be coming online over the next month or so. Uh, and also additional web-based productivity software. And uh, Matt is up for creating the new three-year technology plan because that comes up this year. Facilities uh, is it's an ongoing battle. Uh, we, we continue to prioritize projects. We continue to have far more projects than we can ever uh, fund in any one year and would ever, will ever fund as long as we operate with the current capital and capital projects levy, but we really do focus and I think our folks do a great job, but it's a, it's a, a long job of going through that process of, of uh, getting all those projects in line. We have a 10-year plan that makes that happen, and we'll need to also continue to address building security. Then with budgets and funding, uh, we need to continue to work with compliance issues tied to the state shutdown. 
uh, as you can imagine, Stephanie and the members of the business department have had uh, a great deal of headaches over the last several weeks dealing with the fact that for 20 days there was nobody at the department. And now the things are just starting to come back online and we're finding them being very slow in, in terms of ramping pieces back up, including things we need for the operating levy and capital projects levy, but also things like just setting the levy for the school district for next year, the regular levy process, when everything is, has been delayed. We also need to work, I think, with the ongoing need for financial stewardship. Again, it's not only maintaining a fund balance, but it's maintaining a cash balance. Because remember that if you have a fund balance without a cash balance, you still can't spend it. And, you, and if, if you have no cash balance, you have to start cutting programs and staff in order to cash flow. We also need to work on, uh, on maintaining our budget reserve and trying to look at now how, with the reductions that were made last spring, being able to maintain staff and programs not only through this year, 2011-12, but also 2012-13. Finally, our challenge, obviously, is we're working with a 40% funding shift, $2.4 million of additional shift of funding that won't come back to us until they start to pay the shift back. Uh, the potential of short-term borrowing, although we hope we've dodged that bullet now because it looks like as part of this, the state uh, budget plan, they've eliminated the short-term borrowing option for the state. I still haven't started to see the state actually have to borrow money or whether they will come up with another way to come back at us. And then finally, underfunded mandates. Just to name a few, as we move into evaluation, as we move into a number of these other pieces, they're asking us to increase the workload and the activities of folks without providing additional resources to do so. We also need to be very cognizant and very willing to provide comprehensive information on the referendum, both our operating levy referendum and our current capital projects levy referendum help people understand why these are important to stabilize our district's financial picture and by doing so to provide the greatest opportunity to, to support the students and staff of this district for as long as we possibly can. We know as part of that that continues to drive class size issues and we continue to need to deal with Title I shortfalls. So that's where we are right now. Uh, that's the, the, the celebrations, and I think as a board, you need to be very positive about the things that as a school district we've been able to achieve in the last year. I think you can see there's lots of stuff on the plate going forward for 2011-12. But again, I think we've got a district, a board of education, and a staff that are prepared to do that. And uh, again, appreciate an opportunity to share this information with you. Thank you. And I guess I would... Stand for any questions if there are any questions to be had. Board members, do you have any questions for Dr. Richardson? Julie? Well, I have some comments. First of all, I want to thank you, Dr. Richardson, for your vision and leadership because this is really quite an impressive, an impressive list of what's been accomplished. I mean, certainly by no means are we perfect, but I think it points to a really well-run um, district um, in, in many ways. But I think what I'm most proud of is that um, there's all, you know, the conversation is all around the achievement gap, and I think what we've said is that we're looking to raise the achievement of all students, and we've really had a laser focus on that. And things like the PLC and Flexible Learning Group all point to, you know, that priority for us, and, and I'm really proud of that. Um, with that being said, it's, you know, uh, obvious that this would not happen without a shared commitment from everyone district-wide to um, pursue excellence at every level. So, you know, thanks to everyone who contributed to this, um, really district-wide. Yeah, this, this is, has been a great staff to work with. I think people really understand the needs and I think uh, come together and work on, on the processes that we need to do to really make a difference. It's, it was very obvious, you know, when we went into the budget reduction process this spring. When you can put 180 people from the community and the, and the district together and go through the process of, of identifying, you know, over $700,000 in cuts and then move forward with very little 
backlash very little you know concern on the part of our community to actually make those reductions happen uh, I think it speaks volumes for the amount of, of support uh, and I hope the trust that our community has in the fact that we're doing the right thing for our kids yeah also like to thank you and your efforts for the process of the charter school authorizing and I know they know when we got turned down the first time and it's kind of yeah it's, that. it's never fun I, I don't I don't like to lose well but, <laughs> but um, you know it's it's nice to be I guess I don't know if it's nice or otherwise to be in a very exclusive group but given there are only I think about five public schools total and we know that basically these three of those have almost the same information in their authorizer documents because the other two people I just basically sent them our stuff and said use whatever you want and they did and that's fine because I think we had a good plan but um, given given that there's not a lot of districts in the state that are willing to step up and try to maintain uh, choice for kids thank you for your work on that appreciate that thank you anyone else good I had good report thank you I just had a, a couple um, one uh, it's really nice to have this format because I you know as as been a, having been a board member for a few years to be able to compare year to year the accomplishments it's it's tremendous um, I was curious since Matt is here every year we, we talk about the smart classrooms and it's just amazing the number that we keep adding and do we have any sense of how how far we've infiltrated you, you need to come here Matt. Okay. <laughs> The, the, the audience does not hear you otherwise Very good. go ahead um, we have made great progress these are not cheap things to do so to put what we call the full enchilada in is uh, about three thousand dollars for a classroom and it's it's measure the measurement is way more than that I mean it's it's really a bargain when you think about what it does for student learning and interactivity especially at the elementary level at the end of this summer all of our elementary classrooms general education classrooms will have a smart board and a projector and that's a, a big coup our high school for a number of years has had projectors in all of their rooms and the middle school is now progressing uh, toward that I would say they're probably only at about 50 percent um, in the middle school at that point um, but this year every year the middle school technology committee which is really well run they take requests for who would like to have the projector on smart board and we were able to fund all of the people who requested this year which is really a big deal and so we're very pleased with where we're going. We have a long way to go yet in terms of getting other people up to speed. Julie? Um, I just wanted to comment. I don't escape. I wanted to comment with Matt being at the microphone and thank you for the tech boot camp. I was with You're some welcome. teachers and they had many positive things to say about it. And um, you could probably take a few board members enrolled in that camp. <laughs> Anyone is welcome. The real cool with that is you can think you. about how many of our own teachers were teaching that this year. Mm -hmm. And that is really where the rubber meets the road because people are willing to learn from their colleagues more than they are from you know the high priced person that you bring from outside. So really that's where the best learning during that week occurs. Thank you. You're welcome. Your it's a yeah. lot of work. Fun. Anyone else? No? Thank you, Dr. Richardson, and thank you, Matt. we have no items for individual action so we will move on to the consent grouping there were a number of items in the table file you have the um, additional uh, personnel items as well as the TRA part-time teacher program which is at no cost to the district as part of the consent grouping is there anything that anyone wants to pull from the consent grouping okay is there a motion to approve the consent grouping I move. move by no Second. Second. Second by John. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of approving the consent grouping say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> Items for information. Um, you will have had in your board packet the workshop week schedule for licensed staff and EAs. Um, it's really helpful to see the training that's going to be happening in a week, but as Dr. Richardson said, it's already been well underway with the boot camp with the cluster training um, and your and Rogers training on continuing AYP yes. um, and Gary Lewis and Gary Lewis yes. as well so uh, it's it's nice to for the the community to know how even before school starts how much training is is happening in the summer 
Um, I'd also like to remind board members of the closed negotiation strategy session, which will follow immediately after this board meeting. You'll see the future meetings coming up um, September 12th and September 26th, and our fearless leader will be back with um, all our students in session and, and her college students in session. So with that, I ask for a motion that we adjourn. Before we adjourn, I would thank uh, Ellen for doing a yes. remarkably no, okay. wonderful <laughs> job. First time <laughs> as uh, vice chair. And well that's done. great. Thanks. Thank you so much for your work. Thank and you. with that, I would uh, move we adjourn the meeting. Second. All right. Moved by Noel, seconded by Jeff. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. <laughs> okay. And, uh,